have that tiny little bit of a getaway mechanic, right? It's still uh, mm -hmm. one and a half seconds, and that's going to be plenty of time. Even just if you wanted to go more into the flame guard side of things, right? That absorbs a lot of this magic damage. That's the majority of the damage that a, a primal beast is doing early on. All right, good old pause to kick things off. It is the first game of the... Uh, first game of the day, as uh, we've been reiterating, so the teams, you know, really want to make sure all their technical issues are taken care of. Yeah, as we got another long day of Dota ahead. Again, a lot of the teams playing anywhere from four to six games in some cases. Uh, yesterday, you know, we were, we were pointing that out, even with especially some games being a little bit longer, but by the end of the day, uh, the, some of the teams even understandably looking a, a little more exhausted, but hey, that, that's part of the grind, Dinog, in terms of these group stages. That's, that's part of the experience. Not only do you have to be just individually great Dota player and teams in these games, but you have to be able to withstand just the, the barrage, uh, the amount of Dota that's coming at you from so many different angles and so many different teams. That's what makes this event so epic in a, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, the the favorable point towards that is that you're not alone. Like, this is not something that it's only affecting your team, right? Every team goes through yeah. the exact same experience, so no one's going to be advantaged. Uh, you're going to have, you know, some days where you're playing three series, some days where you're playing four. It just happens. You know, that's what the schedule is going to lead to. So we're going to see Beast Coast going for a little bit of an aggressive movement here. It's not exactly a lineup that loves to go into the... Uh, the stacks, so I don't think they're going to look to put down any kind of detection super early on. Yeah, but they're hunting out in the mid lane as we got Tiny scouting it out. Gojiro's going for a little bit of a exploration. See what he can maybe find. Has that toss ready to level up and use if uh, for happens to catch somebody. As our shaker will avoid, they're going to get some vision up here on the high ground. Yeah, it's going into the jungle and towards that mid lane as well, but oh, snaking. Yeah, he is in trouble. Stormhammer connects. Tiny is there as well for a follow-up eventually. This should be a first blood. Can they get it to Sven? Eh, it's not going to be for Sven, but Stinger, he'll take it. First blood. Yes. <laughs> Give it to the support. That's what we want to see. We're actually going to start, it feels like, with maybe a tri lane up towards this top side. Uh, with Stinger maybe just trying to get a, a free kill, a sneaky extra kill to force uh, another TP back to the lane. Gojira looking to block up the camp for now, reveal himself, maybe lull them into a false sense of security. But now he, he's going to TP down, especially once this ward sees that Whisper is on his own, blocking in the lane. The thing, issue now is, yes, you needed the Glaives of Wisdom to be able to secure that kill, but it doesn't provide as much to be able to deal with this bottom lane with the Eidolons now spawned. So they're going to have a little bit of a weaker point until they're at least level 2 on Beast Coast. Watching top lane, Fortune Zen coming out, the immediate metamorphosis from Skitter <laughs> going for the combat against the heroes, trying to throw that intimidation factor out there and getting plenty of damage. So Whisper, this is a strength hero after all, so, you know, pretty tanky, and especially with that gauntlet of strength. Not necessarily too concerned about dying, but has to use some early on region. Bottom lane, that's a uh, kill down there. All right, so Silencer going down for the second time. Yeah, this is that big weak point that I was talking about, right? The first time. You've got that... Uh that period before you're level two, before you have ways to deal with the Eidolons. And if you have a hero that doesn't have mobility like the Silencer, then if you get caught on the wrong side of the Fissure, you have the Eidolons split into six. Even if they're just level one Eidolons, they're going to get kills. Apologies. Uh, going down for the first time, he got the kill in the first. So K1 ends up being a one here. for one now. Yeah, he is in trouble. K1 going a bit too aggressive to not expect that Fissure angle, but as we see, might die. Well, nah, now he definitely may die. The Malphite stun's going to hit. One more to connect, one more auto attack, and there we go. Soxa will pick it up, and I mean, I know you don't, you're making the point you don't like the Earthshaker, but that's one of the reasons why he's potentially picked up, right? It's just the laning phase especially, hiding in the trees, and suddenly that long-range stun of the Fissure comes out, and then a kill shortly after. Yeah, I suppose. Maybe a, a big reason why they went for that was because of the Silencer not being positioned quite effectively. Because he TP'd down from the top side of the map, he didn't have the TP to immediately get back to the lane. So Tundra saw that there was this small opportunity for them to get that kill. And, you know, kudos to them. They uh, achieved it quite effectively. Gotta make sure that Sarks doesn't get this pull-off. Oh. Yeah. He's going to. <laughs> well, so successful pull. Good lane, lane control coming out from Tundra. I didn't actually mention that, uh, you know, Tundra with playing on the dire side of the map, it's something that they 
heavily uh, prioritized in the latter stages of the DPC. They wanted to make sure that they had this so that if they had a bad lane in this off lane, they wanted to enable Sox to be able to make rotations by pulling the wave back behind the tower, but they actually don't need to this game. They're just having that good of a laning stage through a lot of good micro that it's not going to be as much of an issue. Like they've already up onto level three. Yeah, Cookie jump in. Snake King will fall. Whisper, too much burst damage. That scatter blast on a couple more auto attacks. That was just good initiation. It was coming out from the avalanche initially from Tiny, then the Cookie stun in, and not much more he could do at that point, especially with the Terra Blade. What's well, really is he going to be able to assist with? Yeah, bottom lane. Silencer getting low himself. Curse is up. Zoxid is running at him, though. Has the Enchant Toto, but no Aftershock, of course. Nice little splits coming through there from 3 3 as well, but yeah, there we go. K1 instantly just stuns it up, cleaves it down. And now you're starting to even out the lane a little bit more. You're always going to be a bit behind because of getting those uh, those denies onto the range creeps. But if you're able to clean up the Eidolons, it actually goes a little bit more in your favor, both in terms of gold and experience. Mm -hmm. All right, now those spend 23 and 4. Talk about, uh, you know, a fair amount of those are those Eidolon kills. You look at the net worth and, you know, it's not necessarily reflecting having the top CS in the game, understandably. But he's, he's up there. He's doing pretty well. Still very early on, though, as we're... Coming up to four minutes into this game, and speaking of that, Primal Beast mid lane is looking to go for some rune control, standing around, and he'll pick up the water rune up at the top as nine goes to the bottom one. But yeah, so far the landing phase seems like it is definitely a favor for Beast Coast as all three of their cores happen to do pretty well. But bottom lane, Sven, there's again that Fissure, the Malphus started the Eidolon damage, adding up where is Silencer? He's off to the left, he's not here, and Soxa is going to keep running at him, but Fissure still 10 second cooldown, so K1 avoiding death. They're going to need to ferry out some more regen. That was the very last piece. Oh, actually, never mind. The Silence has got it on the courier, so should be able to keep Soxer away. But he might actually end up falling himself down here, Stinger. Yeah, I'm not sure about that positioning, as Soxer just easily wraps around with those boots of speed, and Silencer ends up going down. So that, that seemed like overconfidence. And speaking of overconfidence, now K1's in trouble. No he's got some wand charges, only four though. Yeah, the, the region's not there, and he's gonna pop a war cry, and hopefully he can run away out of this. No, the fissure put the wrong side, so he's good. Ah, oh, it happens sometimes. Sea Smile actually making the rotation down towards the wow. bottom side of the map, realizing that there's no fissure, but you still got the Malefus. Yeah, they're, they're not killing the beast though. Yeah, <laughs> well, what is we... happening? No? Stinger's just, going they in. really realize they need to get aggressive onto this Enigma. He's having far too good of a game. It's not necessarily showing on the net worth, but in terms of levels, he's in a really healthy spot. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, they are really playing aggressive at the tower. Of course, that's what the creep wave happens to be. And right now, it's, it is the Radiant side that actually has the health advantage. So a little more understandable there, I suppose. We did see Nine go for that one point into the Searing Chains just to make that mid lane look a little bit better for himself. He's now level six as well. Oh, he gets the bump back, so he's not going to get the TP back to base as well. Really nicely done by C Smile to be able to interrupt that. Might put a little bit more emphasis onto these power runes that are about to spawn in about 10 seconds as well, but you can see the person making the rotation first is Saxa. No assistance being given to C Smile by his supports. Let's see how <laughs> lucky he is. Yeah, just happens to avoid, and he's not lucky enough. Nine will pick up the invis, and he'll even pop it right away. He just wants the man on the health. He's not too concerned about using the invis rune for anything else at that point. Top lane, Gojira going deep in. They're going to toss the illusion over to Skitter, but Gojira still in a pretty awkward spot. Avalanche on Snaking. Snaking. No Fates Edict yet. And not, no one's going to die, but just plenty of back and forth there at the top lane. Yeah, he's been holding on to a point for quite some time. Now he's got the phase edict. Level 4 is pretty natural time for you to get it anyway. But I think they've just had really good communication about where exactly that Primal Beast is going. Uh, we've seen in the past at like 3 minutes, maybe 4, Primal Beast with the bounty rune that they pick up from the enemy side of the map has... Oh, actually speaking of Primal, mid lane. They're gonna get the kill. On to the Earthshaker now. Ember Spirit, he could be in trouble. No Pulverize matter. with the curse. He's got enough mana. He'll get out of there. Close call, though. Yeah, I think he popped a mango just to be able to get away there. So nicely done by Nine, making sure he had that remnant available for himself. But yeah, we've top seen lane. Primal Beast make rotations up towards top. Like, Speaking of top, Snaking, he's trying to lift. The auto attack is not enough damage. I believe maybe the sticker or the fairy fire or something of sorts keeping Snaking alive. But now Gautier just walks right up and throws in an auto attack to secure the kill. The courier's even coming in. But now he needs to be careful himself. Going to toss Skitter away, and then Metaform ends up getting the oh, Courier kill. Game. But at what cost for him? He's in a bad spot. Here comes C-Smile. Smashes his face into the ground with the Pulverize, and 
makes a kill happen on a terror blade. So Beast Kill is happy about that exchange. Yeah, so that's the kill that I've been wanting to see for quite some time, but maybe they just didn't feel confident in going for it with the Oracle alive previously, right? Because of the reason that I mentioned during the draft, the the Fates Edict. If you have that 100% magic immunity and Sea Smile makes that rotation to kill a Terra Blade, who's pretty damn squishy, especially to magic damage, then it feels so wasted, right? You would get so much more out of the map by nine, and I mean, he's such a quality mid laner that you can't leave him alone. Ooh, yeah, you see Earth Shaker. See Smile, he's got an yeah. Arcane Rune, he's heading up top again. They're gonna want to prioritize the Oracle first, and then if they can use that to converge in onto the Terra Blade, but just TP back to the lane, and showed that he just TP'd back. That'd be a big accomplishment for them. He pops the uproar. Meanwhile, Gojira catches the Oracle, tosses him into both of them, pulverized, being used onto the Earthshaker. Soxa, he's one in trouble. Oracle using the Fates Edict on himself. Reflection. Trying to help keep them away. The one of his kisses from afar, though, and see Smile on that killing spree now as he'll take out the support Oracle. Now they're going to go back up to the tier one top lane and try to push that in. But Skitter definitely finding himself in a pretty difficult spot for early farm is going to. As we usually see, have to find himself in the jungle, using those illusions, getting that farm. As Stingrex mid lane, by the way, don't think he's living through this one. Slide a fist, and Nine makes that kill happen at least. Yeah, they're making pretty decent trades happen out of it on Tundra, Nine especially, but you just can't come back up towards this top lane. You know, Beast Coast have won this top lane pretty handedly, and I think they've just gotten a little bit too caught out by a couple of positionings. Like, like I mentioned, Oracle is good against the Primal Beast, but I feel like they really thought it was going to be thrown into the off lane instead of being mid. So the fact that C Smiles had such a good early game, second on the net worth, really goes to show what a quality player he is. Yep. <laughs> Snaking sees a problem beast in the jungle, immediately turns around. It's like, team, we kind of want to deal with this guy. Well, what do we do? Yep. He's going to kind of go back and forth, and not much he can do by himself, of course. But C Smile will respect that enough. And he starts falling back and going to head back towards the mid lane now. As, speaking of mid lane, Nine is the one kind of shining star of sorts for Tundra, right? He's, he's up mm -hmm. there with net worth with the cores on the other side. Um, he's going to be working on a Maelstrom, already has an Orbit Corrosion. How impactful does Nine need to be in this game? Oh, it, massively, right? Like, he is the one creating a lot of the havoc on the back lights. He's the one that's going to prevent this Tiny from getting these big, you know, avalanche toss combos off eventually. And, I mean, if you can take out a Silencer to start the team fight, then, you know, how much is opened up for the rest of your team? You could suddenly feel like you could use all of these spell casting ultimates much more effectively, both from the Oracle, Enigma, and the Earthshaker. So that's going to be Nine's main priority once these team fights start to break out. Vlad's just finished by 3 3. He's in trouble. Onslaught. And oh, he thought about casting a black hole, it almost looked like right there. But either way, he is going to get easily killed. And no chance for an escape it, at that point. Oh, he did? Oh my gosh. Yeah, he did. Okay, yeah. well. The shortest cool black down. hole in existence. That's, that's how I It didn't even appear on you my know, screen. Just an I mean, yeah. black hole that wipes me out. No, no pain, nothing like that. That's how I want to go. <laughs> That was something. Yeah, that was a... Uh... All right, that's going to be on cooldown now for a bit. Again, you can tell it's just one of those things in the heat of the moment. You're just trying to make the big play, have some TP support come in and do the big turn. Would have been epic, but not to be. It was a very, like very risky rotation one. from Tundra. They're going to be looking to go for K1. They're going to try and bait out some sort of movement towards the tower, and they're going to see K1 farming this. This would be a big pickoff. They're getting it. Yeah, Snake King's like kill secured. <laughs> Pops of purifying flames. I mean, yeah, Ember Spirit, he probably had that kill, but yeah, good. Kill secured. We'll call it that. And now he hits level six as well as he gets the tome delivered, I believe. So false promise now online for the Oracle. Of course, uh, an important ability to keep in mind. This this Ember Spirit, he is going to farm, especially now with that happening. He is very well on his way to that Maelstrom. It kind of goes back to your point that it's exactly what Tundra needs. They need him to have a big, especially early to mid game, create that presence by the time for the Terror Blade to pick up his farm. Oh, absolutely. And uh, it's just the things that they did beforehand, right? That's where I feel like Tundra have put a lot of work into a lot of their priorities, a lot of their shot calling. It's like, all right, we have to... You're going to move here in about 30 seconds, you're going to shove the lane out, and then we're going to go for this play because they're going to need to show some sort of information that's going to lead us to be able to have that opportunity. Fight towards the bottom rune. Not really, just a little bit of a back and forth. Oh, this one's a little more than a back and forth. Stinger, gonna pop a global silence for this. Buying time as the onslaught's coming in. It's not gonna connect though, and Ember Spirit, but it gets the pulverize off. And down falls Ember Spirit. Talk about a very critical kill for Beast Coast. Stinger even credit for it, but that's some nice intelligence gain for himself. But yeah, 
that's a huge turnaround. A very good use of the global science there. Yeah, and now you've got K1 who's able to sit down on here on the bottom side and do what K1 does best. He is one of the best farmers in the world, and I mean, you can just see what he does on a hero like the Sven, right? He's just able to accelerate that incredibly quickly. You know, so occasionally he gets caught out from plays like we saw previously from that rotation, but if you've got teams like uh, Beast Coast backing you up, like this movement towards the top side, that's going to pick him oh, up no. really easily. Yeah, no chance. He's got Sunder, but zero chance to use it right there. Just way too much lockdown, and he's not necessarily the tankiest at this point, especially against all that magic damage burst coming out, so good kill on a Terror Blade. And, I mean, Beast Coast is moving. They're, they're moving around. Especially, I go back to the kill on Ember Spirit. That's the one critical one. They got a 4,000, almost 5,000 net worth lead now, and we have to keep in mind what Sven is doing on top of all this. He's not necessarily looking to fight himself. He's been farming away. He's got the Echo Saber. He's got his Mask of Madness. So he's got his tools to help him really accelerate in this game and now work towards the BKB, which, as usual, feels like that item that uh, could be the one that really turns things on for Beast Coast. But mid lane, Whisper. Oh, he's out of range of the Fissure, and that's going to be the end of that exchange, or is it? Nine wants a kill, but at what cost? What are you thinking, buddy? Onslaught in. He's got the side of Fist. Can he get out? No. Okay, Ooh, he's going to be saved by the False Promise. Beautiful timing indeed, so Ember Spirit, does he live through this? Another side of Fist, he's getting away, and they lose the Oracle, but Nine easily healed up. Black Hole from 3-3, no stopping him. Yes, it's, it's going to be the lockdown of the Sven. They get the kill with the Echo Sam assisting. Silencer also caught by Nine. That false promise coming in the clutch from Oracle and allowing for the turnaround for Tundra. Gojira likely to fall as well. He's got some speed, but there's the Fissure. And down falls Tiny. What a turnaround, but that's the factor of Oracle. Yeah, instant reactions as well from Snake King, easily winning them that fight. But Nine, that's the reason why he can look to commit that deep, right? They find the pickoff, they split up the team fight, they force the movement, and they force out these big ultimates to start coming from Beast Coast when they're not actually ready to fight. He breaks your formation. That's what's great about an Ember Spirit. You've got multiple avenues for escape, and you've just got an extra one when you've got the Oracle to play around. That was massive for the side of Tender, just as we're talking about how Beast Coast really accelerating, Sven doing his farm thing, working on the BKB. Uh, uh, uh. I mean, again, that was so close to even being better for Beast Coast, but that one ability at the right time from Snake King completely turning the tide of that one. And that again, that's one of those moments in a game like this where you can maybe start seeing the tides change. Now Terra Blade back in the jungle. I'm not saying he's certainly looking good yet. He, he has a lot of work to do as he's working on a Manta style. But uh, it goes back to you. So how should Tundra be playing this, though? You, does Ember Spirit, um, he doesn't have the Maelstrom yet, but I was going to say, does he need to be a little more active now, look for kills, or does he need to sit back and farm himself? But almost getting involved there. I think he needs the Maelstrom. He's got it coming out to him now, and he's going to have the level 12 as well on the Fire Remnants, just for that little bit of a damage boost. If they could catch out Sea Smile for free here, that would be enormous. He's essentially doing the, the Ember Spirit role for Beast Coast, being that frontliner. So the fact that you force the back from an aggressive movement and force a BKB to be popped, you're going to be incredibly happy. And if you can pick off a, a position one like Whisper, good movement there by Kojira tossing him back. Yeah, that's Snapfire. Yeah, getting some nice team assistance to stay alive. But again, Tundra, that was a great response on their part. The fact that they almost killed Primal Beast, as mentioned, but if anything, using the BKB. It's kind of a minor victory of sorts for them, but speaking of BKB, I look back at K1 farming away up in his own triangle up there, but another fight is about to break out. Both teams pretty content on trying to control this Radiant Jungle down here, and now Global Silence. Snapfire, he was gone initially, but turning with the kiss is a jump onto Oracle. They say no false promise for you this time, big boy. And they take out Ember Spirit as well. 3-3, three, three, he's in trouble. Malphus stuns on Tiny, but Smile. You know he's going to be looking to engage soon. Three seconds on that onslaught. Toss it in the whisper. Slow down with the scatter blast. As meanwhile, silencer able to help get the kill onto the Earthshaker. They do catch up to 3 3, and he's going to do a lot of damage in return, but it's just too much to handle. So the thing and is, down I, goes actually quite liked, I liked Tundra's movement there, right? They found the initial pick off. They, well, not pick off, but like person to gank onto because they had decent vision at the time. They knew that the Primal Beast didn't have a good amount of HP and he didn't have the BKB but they didn't know that the Snapfire had the Aghanim Scepter freshly picked up so they actually get the counter initiation mm. happening they take out the Oracle to be able to start the fight and that just leans so much more into their favor, right? All of this magic damage burst that they've got is enabled by the fact that the Oracle is just not a part of the team fight at all. 
Yeah, that's one of those uh, items that certainly can catch you off guard. Similar to like a blink itself, of course. In terms of getting jumped on, so well played by Beast Coast. Timing happened to be working out for them right there. And But man, the fight's just continuing to die. They just want to keep big. going. In fact, speaking of that, Terrorblade, this could be big, but the False Promise immediately coming out. So he's surviving for the time being, but he's taking way too much damage right here. The Smackdown with the Pulverize, and there is really no chance he's actually going to live through that. So he's out for 30 seconds, and Ember Spirit makes a point to retreat, and so does the rest of the team. But we see our first use of that BKB on Sven. Popping that God Strength and just cutting down the Terror Blade. But apparently, again, we're still going as Soxa gets thrown back in there. Thanks to Gojira. Primal Beast still went too far ahead. Might need to be careful. Stop. Trying to get the kill onto the Earth Shaker. Not going to be enough. They killed Oracle, though. And now Nine, he's trying to run away. He's got the Fire Remnant. Waiting to use it. They're sitting on it, though. He's, he knows he's in trouble. Oh. He's going to use another one. But the Smackdown with a Storm Hammer. Secures the kill onto him, and they get 18 kills now in total as they also take out Soxa. Beast Coast online. I mean, that's the thing from Nine, right? He has to play like that. He had three Fire Remnants to play with, but you have to play kind of suicidal just to be able to try and create that little bit of extra havoc. But this is such a huge timing for Beast Coast, and they're executing it amazingly. I was thinking that they're not going to be able to get super active because K1, he needed the BKB, right? You can't fight into all of these slows, these stuns, these big ultimates because they've got the potential to kite you out. But now that they've got the gobble up on the Snapfire, you don't need to wait for the mm -hmm. BKB. And because of all these successful team fights uh, so you don't need to wait for the blink dagger but he's almost got the blink dagger because of how well beast coast have played these past like four or so minutes yeah with the tiny tiny has his own blink and then you mentioned with the spin is just about coming for him so his initiation is just keep catching tundra off guard and getting jumped first usually results in a pretty bad time <laughs> see right there the gobble up on the creep throwing him forward not gonna connect though funny animation still yeah. to look at but yeah that blink just about there for k1 looking very good terror blade it's been rough there really is no if and buts about that um bkb himself though is that potentially at least a, a game changing item this game where you feel like it's just too little too late and they're gonna need more but hold that thought because ember spirit wow that is some burst damage Oh yeah, and they're picking out that they've got the vision around here, so I wonder if Beast Coast are going to look to set themselves up to be able to counter any kind of dewarding action that's going on, or maybe even prioritizing this mid tower, considering they know that they're probably going to be preoccupied with getting rid of the vision, enabling uh, Skeeter to continuously farm, because yeah, he's, he's fallen a fair way behind, now about 4,000 behind what you've got on K1. Yeah. Who they catch here? That's Oracle. Fates Edict, False Promise. He is going to use it on himself. I don't think he's living, though. It's just not going to even look at him. They're like, yeah, you're dead. <laughs> he's like, what's the point? Yeah, just uh, that, you know, the explosion's going off. Turn around, he's got to look cool. That's what K1 doing, doing right there. So, knew the kill was successful. Gets away. He's just pushing out the bottom lane by himself. Mid lane, Ember Spirit, doing what he can. But you see this Primal Beast. He's ready to engage once again. He's got a haste bottled up and this is definitely a team i mean yes there's global silence but overall this is a team cooldown wise where beast coast can just keep going i mean oh, oh that's a big days. stop on enigma yeah stopping the tp and now he is likely dead as well they're not going to go in to give him a free black hole as i say that probably he's charging to get to go Soxa, he's not going to be able to tp out good attempt there it's just too much firepower i this again beast coast just looking impressive playing fast and there's no way to stop this at this point, it seems like, for Tundra. Yeah, I think for, for Beast Coast, the, the big thing for mine is the difference between the position fours. Not necessarily in terms of player quality, but in terms of what the heroes are able to do. You know, I highlighted in the draft the difference between what a Tiny can provide versus what an Earthshaker can. And you can just see it on the mm -hmm. kill feed, right? 6, 1, and 9, the old Ray Mysterio score for Kajira. And then you've got uh, 2, 4, and 5 for Saxa. He's just not able to have as much impact because he's not able to get these repositions off. You're not able to consistently stun for as long from as long range, right? And you're even tanky enough now with the uh, single point in the grow to go onto the front lines and like put a little bit more aggressive wards up on Gajira and it, it, I don't know it just feels so much more comfortable playing around a tiny versus an Earthshaker right now unless you're truly an Earthshaker specialist yeah well, it's gonna be a Roshan time now our first one of the game East Coast uh, they've got enough hero kills at 22 at 22 minutes into the game they want to kill this big boy Roshan get that Aegis I assume we're gonna see it in the hands of Sven 
and this is not going to be contested by Tundra. So I, so I go back to this Terra Blade again. He's finally got the BKB now. I, I know the answer, Danag, is the BKB, it's not like, the, okay, now they're going to be fine, but what? how realistic is this now, at least with the BKB? Does it give them a fighting chance, or is it still he's got to farm way more? You know, against a lot of carries, I would be like, you know what, this is actually fine. It's going to allow him to farm a little bit more aggressively and be able to recover that net worth. But even with the Terra Blade, who's a really good farmer, plus the Illusions, you're up against a Sven, and a K1 Sven at that. So it's not like it's going to bridge the gap all that much unless Tundra take a few effective team fights. So I almost feel like they have to fight relatively soon around all of these ultimates, yeah. but it's going to need to be on Saxa and his Blink Dagger. He's a 500 gold away. You've got to give him a little bit more space to get his own farm here. Sure. That certainly seems like the key item. That and maybe a BKB on Ember Spirit who just needs the recipe. That's another one of those. Okay, maybe let's get him that and then we can feel comfortable, you know, trying something. Because you don't want to get caught in that one more item symptom, right? Of they're behind 12,000 net worth right now. So it's, well, wait a second. Now I want this big damage item on Terra Blade or Ember Spirit to fall. Like, you, just, you, you eventually have to try to make some sort of play because uh, you, you're losing that map control. The other well, side just gaining. Look, look at this though, he's hunting Saxa. He's wanting to make sure that he doesn't get that BKB, he gets it delayed, that little bit of extra timing. The good thing is, like, Beast Coast recognize that they've got this period where they're ahead. They've got the Aegis to be able to play around. They actually see the fact that Sea Smile's standing here on the bottom side because of the Sentry Ward, and they're still gonna catch out oh, Saxa. No. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> uh, that was pretty deep, so yeah, Smile's thinking better of that. It's. You know, you have a you have a massive lead. You don't want to necessarily just throw yourselves to the tier four towers at that point. So, but the thing is, Chandra also played to fall that back. well too, right? You just toss out the face edict. It's enough to be able to make him back off. You can see he's actually leveling it up this time, as opposed to the fortunes end, which has a little bit more priority in a lot of games, but not this one. The magic damage output coming through from Tiny Snapfire Primal Beast is way too much to ignore. And I even like how 33 played that one. While this push was happening on the top side, you might think, oh, they gave up a tier two tower for free, but you got a tier two of your own. So that's mm -hmm. a big benefit. You were able to pick up the Blink Dagger for Saxa because of that tower going down with the team gold. So now they go for a smoke up. They really want to try and get that key pick off. If they could burst down Hector from 100 to zero, this would be such a big win for Tundra to get back into this game. Yeah, the timing is still a little bit awkward because he's 20 gold away from the BKB on nine. So, think getting that. In fact, there we go. He purchases it. Now it's being delivered. And so, now in the next 20 to 30 seconds, okay, they'll be actually good to go in the sense of that that's another really big item pickup for them. And from the looks of it on the map, that's not necessarily going to be happening anyways. So, they're he's fine there. Mid. They're trying to find, bring someone towards mid to be able to kill them off to the side here. They know they want to potentially fix these lanes. Doesn't seem like they're going to be able to, though. They're just too split up, and Beast Coast, again, recognize, hey, we got God Strength. They don't have Glyph. Let's just push top. Yeah. Why not push into the base? Let's Down go. 33. That's 33. He's going to be tossed back into Global Silence. The Fate's Edict, but Sven is like, yeah, I don't care about this ability. Just shreds right through it. Skitter's got Metamorphosis, though. Nine is in. Sven is very low. They That's gave the Aegis to the Primal Beast, so Sven is killed. Gojiro. Also in trouble. He's dead. 40 seconds out for. Buyback is ready on the Sven if they wanted it, but of course not necessarily in the position for that would matter. Enigma did use his, but yeah, worth reiterating there that they chose to give the Aegis to Primal Beast over the Sven, mm -hmm. and Sven ends up dying there. It makes total sense if you're playing the Primal Beast onto the front lines, right, to be that havoc causer, to force BKBs to be popped inside of your own base defensively, but... I mean, he was just able to move on forward and use that to effectively kill the Sven without any damage turnaround coming through on Skidder. So despite the fact that he was, and still is, about 6,000 gold behind him, Terrorblade is very, very strong at this stage of the game. <laughs> Going in. Smile. Did he overextend? This would be a big burn of the Aegis. And still. They got the gobble up. That's the follow-up. So toss him in. The black hole right off the bat. They don't have a stop. Yes, they do. The gobble off the toss in gets the stun off. And Enigma, the black hole is eventually stopped. Smile able to onslaught away. Now Tiny in the awkward spot, though. Can he escape? Stinger trying to deal with the Ember Spirit. Gets a cookie assistance. Leap it away and barely survives. And now Ember Spirit's heavily slowed down. Has to turn around. The false promise. Nope. That's actually going to be a pulverize on him. Excuse me. False promise wasn't used. That was just the edict right there. But the onslaught back in. And Earthshaker to a bad spot. Here comes a Godstrength BKB from K1. He shreds. 
to the Earthshaker. Gets attention to Nine, but Nine with his own PKP. At least able to avoid the stun for the time being, but that's going to be wearing off. The False Promise is now used, realizing by Snake King that Ember Spirit's in a lot of trouble. Another slight, but he's in a very bad spot, and that False Promise not going to save him, and it also goes down. So a very successful Man. fight for Beast Coast. Yeah, it started with the gobble up. Yeah, he just wasn't able to get that same amount of impact out of that fight, and it's all on the back of Whisper. He is godlike now, and I mean, this is the reason why he's viewed as one of the best players in all of the SA region. That gobble up to be able to interrupt the black hole was so on point, just able to completely break Tundra's formation, and I even love the way that K1 looked to play around his vision. They knew that Saxa wanted to get that great value out of the Blink Echo. He might even try to do it now. Just will end up backing off. Will he get back in time? Oh, buyback from the Ember Spirit. Here we go. Skitter running out of them. Doesn't use more metamorphosis yet, finally. Okay, he's going to use it now. And now Smile. You see the red numbers coming out. He's walking away. He's got BKB in two oh. seconds. The Onslaught. No, it's not going to be enough. Nine oh. secures a kill on the immediate smoke coming out. They're hunting. Oh, poor Saxa. He whiffed his echo right there as well. He tried to go for the TPing out Silencer, but just wasn't able to land it. Mm. So this smoke, which they might have been able to use to try and claim a kill onto K1, off the back of a relatively successful team fight, isn't going to result in that. Has been killed. Yep. TP's all the way back down towards the bottom side, so K1 knows that they're not going to have the time to be able to path their way all across the map. What Tundra can do, though, is set up some deep vision, which they do uh, in the lead up to this potential for the next Roshan, but with revealing the fact that they just killed the Courier for K1, yeah, it'll slow down his satanic timing a little bit, but he didn't actually have anything on the Courier at the time, so means that mm -hmm. he's going to be able to still just potentially go to the Dire Outpost, pick that one up, and still be fighting fit, ready for this next Roche, which could be up in about a minute and a half. Yeah. Yeah, I see the red timer right there, about a minute and ten remaining, so keep an eye as far as when it switches over. BKB just purchased on Snapfire. Uh, I go back to this Terrorblade, though. Then again, I believe he's got the full data list now going to be coming out as well, so that's... You know, that's an upgrade. We saw the Chrysalis alone. He was starting to pump out some decent damage. Now the Daedalus on top, and I know he's, you know, potentially still a little fragile, but when it comes to his damage output, he's certainly getting a bit more intimidating, and Beast Coast, a 12,000 net worth lead, yes. But I guess where I'm getting at, it feels like Tundra has kind of kept this game in check enough. They still have all their racks up. That They're, they're giving themselves some pretty good hope, at least. Yeah, and I think Beast Coast still need to play off the pickoff side. You, Tundra really don't have a pickoff oriented lineup because you need to commit something like the Metamorphosis to have an effective team fight. You've got these spells like the uh, the Echo Slam, the the Black Hole, and Oracle really doesn't do much damage in these team fights, right? He's needing to be playing super defensively. So I think honestly, the only way that I see Tundra truly coming back into this game is off of a bad pickoff or a bad choice for a team fight from Beast Coast. Mm hmm. All right, so now Beast Ghost, four players pit. smoked. Yep, right around that Roche timer. K1 goes in a couple of seconds too early, but it's not going to matter anyway. Still two and a oh. half minutes away from it respawning. Yeah, it's a very long Roche on respawn, unfortunately, for more so Beast Coast. Like, if it's a quick one, you know, who knows? They can maybe just get in here quickly and take it out, but not going to be the case, so they'll have to figure something else out. Oh, Skeeta knows yeah, someone else is here other than Whisper. They saw the, the Cloak of Flames burn from his neutral item onto the creep wave, so Skeet is going to back off. Uh, he's going to back off a little bit. Let's see if he backs off enough. <laughs> Maybe they're actually baiting him a little bit with Saxa coming in here with yeah. the smoke. Yep, exactly. The smoke. Blink. They're going to go on a Whisper. He's tanky, though. This is a tanky snap fire. The BKB, the Lotus War coming out. The Global Silence as well, preemptively. But 3-3, he has opportunity now for a Black Hole. Not going to necessarily find it, though. As the Kisses. Hitting Oracle, Fates Edict up, but now he's in trouble. <laughs> There's the couple of Toss, and three, three. immediately oh, he's dead, and they do catch three. He's got a black hole, remember, but he's just taking away too much damage. A double kill coming out for K1 and Beast Coast. They're going to keep pushing now. 70 seconds, no buyback for the Enigma. Yeah, and there's that one soul range creep up on the top side, making sure that this backdoor protection isn't going to be an issue. K1 looking to hit in onto the racks. They have no tier 2 towers as well, so with a good 50 seconds on the Enigma's uh, death timer, they're just going to free feel totally free. I mean, by the time he's back up, that Global Silence will be as well. I think K1 can just yeah, have to stick around. He's got the Warcry, he's got the Satanic, he's got the BKB. Plenty of ways to siege this base, but well, they're still mm -hmm. going to pay respect to Tundra. They're going to back off. I see Skitter, meanwhile, doing what he can, just pushing out the bottom lane, working towards an eye of Scotty next. He's got an ultimate orb. 
So at least one of them, but still so much more to be had as see even some more tier three items popping out, but a little bit of ways before those tier four items. Maybe that's uh, Tundra's potential help with the comeback too, if they can wait a little bit longer, get 38 minutes plus and start farming some of those, I suppose. But yeah, the, the game plan, it's become increasingly more difficult for Tundra in terms of how to truly win this game at this point. And Smile, he's going to push out bottom now, but the illusion pushes of Terrorblade is certainly keeping hope alive again for Tundra as well. Yeah. See, Smile, he's almost got up to his level 20 as well, so he's going to get a little bit of a damage boost there, or even survivability. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how much of that is going to be relevant because I would imagine that it's probably going to be the Sven that takes the uh, the Aghanim Shard from Roshan, just because providing that extra passive armor against a Terrorblade is going to enable him to be just even more of that frontline menace on top of the Assault Cuirass that he's got. Stinger mm -hmm. just staying inside the Roche pit consistently, making sure to know exactly when it pops. It's clear how much they're looking to prioritize this. But <laughs> Tundra, they've been able to hold out long enough, and they've got the vision that they see K1 moving towards it. I just don't think they're going to be able to move fast enough, though, not with a Sven, with no. the God Strength committed. Yeah, I know. It's uh, they're, they're not even really making their way over, and I don't blame them. It's uh, Their positioning currently was just too far away. Go for it. You know, farm elsewhere, pushing that bottom lane more. It's exactly what they're doing. But K1 does secure the uh, the Aegis right there. He also has the shard, by the way, for that war cry. It's now being undispellable. The buffed up there. So, again, I feel like they have avenues back into this for Tundra. It's a lot more difficult with the Aegis, especially with the Aegis being given over to uh to the core this time on K1 instead of onto C Smile, just because he is your main building seizure. But I mentioned it before, Tundra, a lot of their spells are super committal, right? The Black Hole, the Echo Slam, and honestly, to kill C Smile with how farmed he, uh, sorry, to kill K1 with how farmed he is, you're going to need to commit a lot of them. And then he's just going to have the second yeah. life. So for me, Tundra just need to try and kite this game out, push out multiple lanes, make sure that their base isn't being sieged, and Beast Coast are not going to give them the opportunity. Yeah, and the 20,000 overall net worth lead on top of that. And you just see Sven specifically, K1, how massive he is, man. That is ridiculous, the farm that he does have, that overwhelming blink constantly being used as well. But it seems like Beast Coast may be comfortable to start pushing out the bottom lane now. Somewhat together as a team with K1 leading the way. Remember, I mentioned that Aegis still 3 minutes, 45 seconds remaining on it, so plenty of time. Terrible, I did get his eye of Scotty. He immediately gives up a Sange for a Sange and Yasha, so again, he's still he's still trying, but another overwhelming blink yeah. as this one's picked up by the Primal Beast now. 33 does have the BKB now, though, and the way that Beast Coast have been taking these team fights is using the Global Silence a lot more aggressively, just to make sure that, for example, the Earthshaker doesn't get the counter initiation. So if he's on point, he's the one that could carry Tundra in these fights, but again, it's going to be so rough. <laughs> uh, Kimo just immediately... Uses God Strength. He is rooted in place. The Fissure also making it awkward, so he doesn't really get any tower damage out initially, but eventually starts happening. 3 3. You can tell they watch him, but look at Smile. He doesn't care. Pops the shield. The overwhelming blink and gets the jump on to the Oracle, who's going to buy back immediately, by the way. BKB from Skitter. Using his Metamorphosis as well. They're returning damage on his fence. Sven needing that team assistance. And it's not going to be enough damage to get the kill. Sven Sorry. will survive the Force F, etc. The Lotus Orb even thrown in there. Manages to keep him alive, so they still have the Aegis. Man, I'm sure that was the call as well from the team. Have a look at Tundra and their ultimate status. They've still got everything, with the exception of the Metamorphosis. So if they were able to take out K1, especially uh, with that Aegis, by the time you switch in your BKB, it's not going to be off cooldown as well, uh, once the Aegis is reclaimed. They could have made that counter-initiation come back. They didn't have the Global Silence to be able to play around with. That was potentially Tundra's option to be able to get back into this game, but K1 getting out and about 100 HP just completely ruins that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see both Silencer and Tiny with a Forest Staff, and both of those came out of the Tiny with that Lotus Orb as well, just doing everything possible to save. So certainly, thanks to the support there, manages to uh, stay alive. But you're right, I mean, 3-3 still with that Black Hole. Global Silence on cooldown for 24 seconds, but again, another case where it just doesn't seem like he's going to get the chance to use it without the Global Silence being ready to be so. They're not putting themselves at the top lane currently. Leia's Tundra, again, having to play very safe and very scared of sorts, pushing out the top, of course, with their racks being destroyed up there. But the reset is here for Beast Coast. God Strength, they have pretty much everything up once again. If not in, now in a couple seconds, and they're going to go right back to the bottom lane. 
What else have we got on the Terror Blade? No evasion yet, but it seems like, uh, yeah, K1's going into the Bloodthorns, so that's going to provide him with a little bit more safety against a lot of that magic damage coming out, of course, the passive. Oh, Terror Blade. Blade. Terror yeah. Blade gets jumped. Yeah, they have a save for him. They're going to try the False Promises up, so Terror Blade pop in the Sunder as well. Going to stay alive for the time being. K1, though, he's feeling confident. He's feeling pretty good. They say Tanek, the God straight at the BKB. Now the beatdown up to Terra Blade. They killed Enigma already. The Global Science now comes out. And Terra Blade is just going to be too much damage to handle. He's out for 70 seconds. K1 getting low. Can but I he's got it? an Aegis. So at this point, he doesn't care. He's coming right back up. Full life, full mana. So yes, a kill for Tundra. But can they kill him a second time without the Terra Blade and the Enigma? That seems like a near impossible task. Well, he's just waiting for him to clump up on someone else to get good value out of the Echo. But they're never doing it. This is great discipline coming through from Beast Coast. Echo Slam solo. On a smile. They oh, might get the, now the gobble up. Gonna keep alive. Tosses it's it back in and says, go get him, boy. They get the kill on our shaker. The smackdown on Ember Spirit. He buys back immediately, but all is said but done. Snake King will also fall. Triple kill for Smile. What a gobble up. That's been that really has been the MVP item, it feels like with the eggs. Pick Wispy, up on Snapfire. Absolute. Beast, well worth the tip coming through there, and GG is called. I mean, what a performance coming out from Beast Coast. I really feel like they didn't address this bottom lane long enough, and it, honestly, I love them as players. 33, Saxa, fantastic across the board, but I saw in that last team fight, 3-3, three, three, he, he was trying to black hole three separate times, and he kept pump faking yeah. it. He was trying to bait out a bunch of other abilities from the enemy team, but if you just don't use the black hole, it's all well and good to have the... Uh, the surprise factor, the fear factor of the Black Hole, but Beast Coast, they're a team that play without fear. They don't really care. They're happy to run <laughs> at you. They're happy to toss back in a gobbled up uh, ally on about 10% HP because they've got the confidence that they got the stuff to be able to take